This second pathway in this journey into emotionally healthy spirituality, it flows naturally from the first. A foundational issue in getting to know ourselves has to do with going back, understanding how our families and cultures have shaped us into who we are today. That's why the second, second pathway is called go back in order to go forward. It's like one of the many paradoxes of the Christian life. A paradox is a statement that apparently contradicts itself. We see this throughout scripture. For example, if you want to be strong, embrace weakness. If you want to be first in God's kingdom, be the last. If you want to be great, be humble and servant of all. So in the same way, to go forward, you also need at times to go backwards. And this principle of going back to go forward is based on two biblical truths. The first is that the blessings and sins of our families going back three to four generations profoundly impact who we are today. And when the Bible uses the word family, it refers to our entire extended family over three to four generations. That, that means your family in the biblical sense includes everyone in your family going back to the mid to late 1800s that we're affected by many events and circumstances during our earthly lives, of course, and yet our families are the most powerful group to which we will ever belong. And what happens in one generation often repeats itself in the next. The consequences of actions and decisions from one generation affect those that follow. So considering the following you know, examples about God's nature from Scripture, you know, Exodus 34, Moses says, show me your glory, and it says, the Lord passed in front of Moses, proclaiming the Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love, etc. And then he ends by saying this, yet he does not leave the guilty unpunished. He punishes the children for the sins of the fathers to the third and fourth generation. And we see the same thing, for example, in the Ten Commandments, Exodus 20. It says, you shall not make for yourself an idol. I'm a jealous God. But then he says, oh yes, by the way, I punish the children for the sins of the fathers to the third and fourth generation. Now, what he's saying is this, that, that as one scholar noted to me, that Hebrew word punish is best translated consequences. In other words, the children tend to experience the consequences of the sins of the fathers to three to four generations. Now again, it's, very, it's not axiomatic, it's a must. It, it, it tends to be passed on. So think about it, it's common to see certain patterns repeating themselves from one generation to the next. Think of families you know, think of your own addictive behaviors, sexual abuse, poor marriages, pregnancies out of wedlock, divorces, affairs, one child running off. We see this even powerfully in the book of Genesis, in the story of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And we know there's a powerful blessing that's passed on from generation to generation, from Abraham to Isaac to Jacob, and to us to this day. But at the same time, we see negative legacies passed on in Genesis 12 to 50. We see a pattern of lying in each generation. We see favoritism in each generation towards one child. We see brothers fighting with each other in each generation. We, we see poor intimacy in the marriages in each generation. But the second biblical principle uh, is equally important. That's this, the discipleship. It really is the heart of the gospel. That discipleship requires putting off the sinful patterns of our family of origin and relearning how to do life God's way in Jesus' new family. The great news of Christianity is that your biological family of origin or your culture does not determine your future. God does. What has, done, what has gone before you is not your destiny. The most significant language in the New Testament for becoming a Christian is, is adoption, is being born anew into the family of God. It's a radical new beginning. When we place our faith in Christ, we're spiritually reborn by the Holy Spirit into the family of Jesus. God becomes our father. All of our debts and sins are canceled forever. We're, we're legally given a new name, Christian. We have a new inheritance of freedom and hope and glory. We have new brothers and sisters, other Christians. And so, for example, in, in Mark 3, Jesus' mother and brothers are, arrive at a house where he's teaching. And they're looking for him to come outside. But Jesus replies to the crowd inside at his house, sitting at his feet. And here's what he says. Who are my mother and my brothers? And then he looked at those seated in a circle around him and said, here are my mother and my brothers. Whoever does God's will is my brother and sister and mother. Jesus declares that the church for the believer is now the first family. Now in the ancient world of Christ, it was extremely important to honor one's mother and father. And yet Jesus was direct and clear. He called people to a first loyalty to himself over their biological families, saying anyone who loves his father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. Discipleship then is the putting off of the sinful patterns and habits of our biological families and being transformed to live as members of Christ's family. This is the Christian life. We honor our parents, we honor our culture, we honor our histories, but we obey God. 
I used to say to Jerry in the early years of our marriage when she would ask questions about my family, I'd say, why talk about it? I'm a new creation in Christ. It's over now. And she'd reply, no, you're not. I, I live with you. And I would laugh because it was true. Every one of us then has to, has to look at the brokenness and sin of our families and culture. The problem is that few of us have reflected honestly on the impact of our family of origin and other major earthquake events in our histories. And, and we can't change what we're unaware of. And that was sure the case with me. In many ways, the longer we walk with God, more levels of how our past has impacted us become clear. The followers are a few unhealthy things or baggage that I unconsciously carried into my Christian life for many years prior to this EHS journey. So, so for example, I, I, was a, I overfunctioned. I did things for people that they could and should do for themselves. So, for example, in my family, my role was to make my mother happy along with my siblings. Since my father was absent for her, he wasn't around. And even though we were children, it was expected that we would take care of mom, not mom taking care of us. So when I became a Christian, I naturally began to take care of other people. Within one year of coming to Christ, I was leading our college Christian fellowship. I was taking care of sheep. I simply transferred being overly responsible in my family of origin to being over-responsible for other people's growth in, in the church as a pastor. Is it any wonder I became a pastor that would care for others? Is it any wonder I had a difficult time with delight and fun, taking care of myself and playing? They were difficult for me. Uh, secondly, what, what was in my family, my, my whole identity of my family was in what you do. Uh, my family was a, was a hardworking family. It was expected that you would work. You'd work. We were Italian Amer American immigrants, uh, my parents, grandparents, struggling to make it in, in America. And there was an expectation. You're going to make your parents proud. We've suffered for you, and you're going to succeed, at least by the American standards. And this performance-based approval ran strongly in the veins of our family. It drove me to work hard. So, of course, I became a Christian. Now I'm working hard for Jesus. I preached grace, but lived work. Resting was very difficult for me. And then, of course, I, uh, thirdly, I, I had cultural, not biblical, understandings of marriages and family. Now, now I preached what the Bible said about marriage, but I lived schizaro. My beliefs regarding marriage and gender roles, they were shaped by much more strongly than my family growing up than Scripture. Of course, Jerry complained as my wife the first seven, eight years, but I'm thinking to myself, all the women in my extended family complained about their husbands. That was normal. Our marriage seemed better than most anyway. I was a Christian, wasn't I? I was helping with the kids, wasn't I? And of course, I'd never observed a joyful, intimate couple, passionate for one another, investing in the quality of their relationship. So again, I preached one thing, but really I was living my family of origin and my culture. You know, fourthly, I resolved conflict poorly. Um, even though, again, I taught workshops on conflict resolution and communications, I, I basically handed it like my family growing up, not Christ's family. My mother used to attack my father. My father would, would give in and surrender and take the blame, and, and uh, my, my dad would avoid it at all costs. And I basically took on my dad's style. I took the blame whenever something was wrong in conflict, just to end the tension. And I, I put a theology on it. Oh, I'm, I'm being like Jesus. I'm going like a sheep to the slaughter. And so again, it was another example of I was doing my family, but I'm, I'm preaching scripture. And again, in my family, it wasn't okay to make mistakes. You drop a dish, you got a beating, or you get screamed at. So in my bones, you know, it's like Christians, I made a mistake, I, I feel terrible. I preach grace, but I'm living kind of under this, under this law. And I could go on, but I think you get the point. But when I look back now at how I lived the first 17 years of my Christian life before all this, I, I'm actually shocked. I'm stunned. I'm a bit embarrassed. And I was a pastor. There was just so much needless pain. You probably heard the philosopher George Santana's statement, those who cannot learn from the past are doomed to repeat it. Well, sadly, when we look deeply beneath the surface of our lives, many of us are not fundamentally doing that many things differently from how our families did them. We have a saying at New Life that we like to use, Jesus may be in your heart, but grandpa is in your bones. So remember, all families are broken, some more so than others. This may be painful uh, for you as some of us have so much buried in our past. I, I was one of them. Others of us may be reluctant to look seriously at our families of origin because we feel like we're betraying them. We need to remember that in 99% of families, our parents did the best they could. They did better than their parents. They moved that ball down the field. But one benefit of going back, actually, as you do this, is you end up more compassionate and understanding of your caregivers or parents when you consider where they came from. So in this session, we want to invite you to embrace God's choice 
to birth us and to birth you into a particular family, in a particular place, in a particular moment in history. And that really uh, should give each of us, a, it gave, gave you certain opportunities, certain gifts. It also gave us each a certain amount of what I call emotional baggage uh, in the journey of life. For some of us, this load is minimal. Others, it's a, bit, it's a heavy burden. True spirituality frees us to live joyfully in the present. But living joyfully, however, requires going back in order to go forward. This process takes us to the very heart of spirituality and discipleship in the new family of Jesus, breaking free from destructive, sinful patterns of our pasts so we can live the life God intends, so we can be a gift to the world. So this is the session that helps many people begin to open up and look deeply beneath the iceberg of their lives. Remember, a broken and contrite heart, God says, I will not despise. Paul himself boasted in his weaknesses that Christ's power might rest on him. I made a decision almost 20 years ago as I entered into this journey we call emotionally healthy spirituality today, that I would no longer put on a face and pretend I would, li I would live and lead first out of my own brokenness and vulnerability. And for this reason, I included my family genogram in the book. I wanted to assure you that it's okay to be open and honest. It's safe to be in the arms and the grace of God. You'll live. As we shall see in the story of Joseph in Genesis 37 to 50, he beautifully embraced his past by grieving and forgiving. He also allowed God to work in him through it. He recognized the invisible hands of God moving in and through all the events in his life, even the tragic ones. It provided a means for him to be a gift to the world. And his willingness to go back enabled him to go forward and become a blessing to nations. And that's my prayer for you as you enter into this study. Hey guys, uh, we are going to be jumping in right where Pete talked about. Uh, we're going to be doing uh, a quick look through Joseph's life. And uh, if you have a Bible and want to follow along, uh, it's Genesis 50, uh, verse 15 through uh, 21. Uh, but before that, I'm going to give you a little bit of a, an intro on this. And it uh, basically starts with the family is an uh, emotional system of two to four generations who move through life uh, together in different places and at different times. When we are uh, born into families, we inherit their ways of relating, their values, their ways of living in the world. Adopted children inherit only uh, birth family traits, but draw on the traits of their adoptive family. Your family stories and uh, your individual story really can't be separated. Joseph is an excellent example of this, uh, of that reality. He was born into a complex blended family where uh, fa his father Jacob, <laughs> Jacob's two wives and two concubines, their children, all lived under one roof. Uh, Joseph was uh, Jacob's favored son. As a result, his brothers grew jealous, leading them to sell uh, Joseph to a merchant who took him to Egypt. Uh, the brothers never expected to hear from Joseph again. After he was sold, Joseph's life became very difficult. For the next 10 to 13 years, Joseph lived uh, first as a slave and later as a prisoner uh, falsely accused of rape. Imagine yourself, we'll jump right into the first question. Imagine yourself in Joseph's shoes, sitting in a prison without any hope of freedom. What thoughts or feelings or doubts might you have about your family, about yourself, or about God? Uh, by the way, on these uh, answers, I would encourage you to write them down or to just go back uh, on the video, spend some time understanding the question, and really jot down the, the answers that come to heart and mind. And uh, they're going to be a useful tool to reflect back on. Uh, in my personal opinion, uh, if I was in Joseph's shoes and I was sold into a prison without any freedom, um, man, I would hate my family. I would think don't trust people or maybe of himself, you're not worth loving. Or don't let people uh, too close to you. Or maybe God hates me. He gave me my parents, right? So... That's a big one um, that a lot of people wrestle with. Um, through God's miraculous intervention, Joseph was pulled from the pit 
of the prison and made the second most powerful person in Egypt. Later, when his brothers came to Egypt for food during the famine in Israel, Joseph invited them to return for their father and live in Egypt, which they gladly did. But after Jacob died, the brothers began to worry. This is where we pick up in the story, uh, the account of Genesis 50, verse 15 through 21. When Joseph's brothers saw that their father had died, they said, what if Joseph holds a grudge against us and pays us back for all the wrong we did to him? So they sent word to Joseph saying, your father left these instructions before he died. This is what you are to do. Um, I ask you to forgive your brothers, the sins and the wrongs they have committed in treating you so badly. Now, please forgive the sins of the servants of the God of your father. When their message came to him, Joseph wept. His brothers came and threw themselves down before him. We are your slaves, they said. But Joseph said to them, don't be afraid. Am I in the place of God? You intended to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. So then don't be afraid. I will provide for you and your children. And he reassured them and he spoke kindly to them. What assumptions are the brothers making about Joseph? In verse 15, he's, they're, they're basically saying, you know, he was waiting until the dad died, until he got his revenge. And also that Joseph still had that grudge that he blamed them for what had happened. What do you think Joseph, uh, why do you think Joseph wept? Well, I, I think he wept. Um, because he had remembered all that he went through. You know, it, it's like uh, reopening a scab, right? It's, it's uh, reliving the past, and it's painful. And that probably brought him uh, grief. On another hand, if he had fully forgiven them, it may just be that he's brokenhearted that they literally don't trust him, that they don't believe that he has forgiven them. You see, Joseph chooses to break the normal way of his family, uh, how they deal with hurt, feelings, and conflict by forgiving his brothers. How might you have responded if you were in Joseph's position? Be honest with yourself if you're in Joseph's shoes. You know, he, he forgave them. And, uh, I mean, as far as if I was in Joseph's shoes, how might I respond? Um, man, I, I probably would have wept as well. I probably would have been bummed that though I've expressed the fact that I love them, he provided for them. He brought them to, to Egypt and, and said, live here and I'll take care of you. And, and yet, even while you're taking care of the individual, they don't believe that you're for them. They literally just thought it was a setup. And that would, that would break my heart uh, to know that someone still thinks uh, that. Because then they're living in fear. My brothers would be living in fear that I'm, I'm going to do something wrong to them. And that just, that's a, a, a reason to weep, a reason to grieve. It goes on in the next question. It says, slowly reread verses 19 through 21. Here we see Joseph's response to the uh, enormous loss he experienced in his life. Carefully consider the different aspects of this response uh, as noted, as you think about your own life story, which one speaks to you the most 
and why. Um, he has here uh, written down three bullet points and one is don't be afraid. And the other is, am I in the place of God? And uh, you intended it for harm for me, but God intended it for good. Carefully consider the different aspects of this and, and how, which, which one speaks to you the most? You know, for me, um, it's the last one. You intended to harm me, but God intended it for good for me. And why would I say that? Um, in Second Corinthians, uh, you know, people say, hey, oh, I have a life verse. Well, I don't know, you know, the whole Bible ought to mark your life. But in one regard, uh, there's a, there is a specific verse that um, was a very big turning point in my own life. And that verse section of verses is from Second Corinthians chapter 1, verses 3 through 11. And it's where Paul, the apostle, talks about how he suffered many things in life. But in suffering those things, um, that God, God gave him a purpose behind it. Let me read it to you. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our affliction, so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. For just as the sufferings of Christ are ours in abundance, so also our comfort is abundant through Christ. But if we are afflicted, it is for your comfort and salvation. Or if we are comforted, it is for your comfort which is effective in the patient enduring of the same suffering which we also suffer. So, for me in particular, I wondered so much of my earlier walk with God, for sure before Christ, but even my earlier walk with God was... Um, was rough. And the reason why is because of that statement that uh, I, I glommed onto. In, in this book, I put, he gave me my parents, right? And, and one of those things uh, in your life that you kind of have an aha moment about is, well, God, if you're real, well, then you must have put me in this family at this time. You chose me uh, to be in this suffering. You knew what was going to happen. You're the beginning and the end, the Alpha, the Omega. So it kind of at first will, will take you for a spin. But then you realize that he did put me in that family. And he did put me in this place. And he knew the family dysfunction origins. But he wants to be a chain breaker. He wants to be someone that shows that life doesn't have to remain dysfunctional, that you could be the very person God uses in your family to change the future. The past is, is marked by all this dysfunction, but God says that he can make you a new creation, that all that suffer, suffering in the past, then he will now comfort you and, and, and reshape your heart and mind and he uses tools like this specific series and his word and the Holy Spirit to move you into a new direction, to change those uh, that are going to come after you, your children, their children, generations going forward. And so as I started to realize that and, and dwell on that, it really helped me to understand and say the same thing, that uh, maybe the enemy, not my parents, but the enemy intended to harm me through a lot of things in life. But God intended it for good, that he would use it one day and, and reshape my thinking and, and who I am. 
and make me a new creation. You know, sadly, I know plenty of Christians out there that that study the word daily, that um, that pray daily, uh, but yet they're they're still living the the dysfunction of their their natural life, the the heritage that they came up in, and they're not changed. They they like Pete says, <laughs> hey, uh, he thinks I'm a new creation, and his wife Jerry said, yeah, not really. I see you on a daily basis. I hear what comes out of your mouth, what's in your heart I see spilled out all over our life, right? And, and so I really encourage you to spend some time on this um, area in particular and, and look at what God wants to do in moving forward. He goes on to the application part. In this, it, uh, it has a, no, uh, it's number nine. It says this, it says, Joseph has a rich sense of being a part of his family of origin and how it shaped his life, both for good and for bad. We must honestly face the truths about our family of origin as well. Prayerfully complete the chart on the following page. Even if you have done a similar exercise before, we often receive new insights when we ponder and reflect on our family's impact on us at a different time. So, first, list the life messages you received from each of your parents or caretakers. So, <clears throat> here he has a box with uh, father and a box with mother and or caretakers. And uh, and for me, on, on the first one, um, it was... <sighs> The message that I received, though my dad loved me, I'm sure of it, um, he, again, was dysfunctioning out of his heritage that he would received, right? But often the message that I received was I was unwanted or I was a burden. And I know that that's not the case. I want you to understand something. These are perceptions that we have. Remember, as a child... The child doesn't understand all that's going on. You just have your perception of what's going on. And so, but you live with that and it marks you for the rest of your life, right? So my perception was that I was unwanted and, and a burden. And then from my mother, well, I was not worth loving. And the reason why is because she had a, a, a very uh, hard time with her own history and um, they split up and she wasn't able to be around, uh, from two years old. And so the perception that I had was that I was not loved. I was not lovable. So the second or the next is list any earthquake events that sent aftershocks into your extended family, abuse, premature or sudden death, losses, Divorce, shameful secrets revealed, things of that nature. Earthquake events for me uh, looked like um, my mom at two years old uh, trying to commit suicide. I remember my brother and I were the first ones in the room to see her. And uh, the first memory I have is of the ambulance driving away. That was an earthquake moment for me. Um, I was taken from my dad. Uh, well, also, we were placed in uh, foster care and group homes. And then I went to be with my father. And uh, at 10 years old, I was then taken from my dad. And I was put into foster care and group homes again. And so that was a um, an earthquake moment. At 15, um, there was a lot of dysfunction in the home. And I ended up homeless. And uh, that was earthquake. Uh, you know, at 15 and you're, you're out on the streets trying to figure out how to provide for yourself or how to feed yourself or how to, what to do. Right. Um, at 19, um, I had lost my daughter and, uh, and she, my, my ex-wife took off with her and, uh, I, I literally didn't meet her until she was 24. Um, but that loss of my daughter was an earthquake moment. Those are a few markers for me. 
uh, I would encourage you to write some down for you. Uh, and then the next will be review the three separate boxes and summarize what messages about life, yourself or others you uh, in internalized. Then fill in the bottom box, the cumulative message I received. Um, that cumulative message for me was I have no value. I don't matter. Um, I'm unlovable. Those are the, the, the markers for me. How about for you? Share with the group the messages you received and how those messages compare with the messages below that reflect who you are in the new family of Jesus. So, my perception from the, the baggage that was given to me from the baggage my parents received uh, was that I was unlovable. I was um, unwanted. But you see, God says, it's good that you exist. He says, you're lovable. He says, you're good enough. You are a joy. You have nothing left to prove. Your needs are a delight. You're allowed to make mistakes. Those are things that God would speak over your life and want to reshape some of those early perceptions that you brought in and marked and shaped your life. God wants to speak life into you. He came that you might have life and that life more abundant. What might be one specific message from your family of origin that God has revealed to you today that you want to change as a part of your hard work of discipleship? For me, um, it's that people can, can literally not matter. I, I want that message to be reshaped in the hard work of discipleship. I, I, I want to remind myself and ask the Lord, well, first off, actually to lay that at God's feet and, and literally to, to pray and ask the Lord to reshape that in me. And then remind myself daily of God's promises to me, of God's love to me, you know, a lot of people look at the Bible like it's a, a book of rules or it's a historical document. Um, they look at it as a lot of things. But do you know what it's most about? God's love for you. His desire to see you flourish, renewed, strengthened, to literally become a new creation. And that he paid dearly to make that happen. It's a love letter. I want to leave you with that one thought. And uh, next week, we're going to be jumping into session four. Uh, again, if you don't have the book, I, I highly recommend that you get it. Uh, my wife lives with me and uh, listens to these things all the time. And literally, uh, she was struggling a little bit on an issue. And she, I, I handed her the book. I said, hey, read chapter three. And she did. And uh, she spent the morning crying, literally. Uh, it, it shook some things in her, but it shook some good things in her. And uh, I would recommend that you grab the book and go through it with us Um Number session four will be journeying through the wall. You, you're at a wall here in this moment and, and you're faced with the hard work moving forward, but we're going to have a journey through that wall and see some breakthrough. So come back and join us next week.